Uh, my name is uh, Ilan Pape. I am uh, a senior lecturer in the Department of Political Science in Haifa University. Uh, I was born in Haifa. I lived most of my life here. Uh, and I have written several books on the history of the conflict and particularly on the history of the 1948 war. I, I started to be interested in Middle Eastern history in general as an undergraduate in the Hebrew University. Uh, and through my BA studies in the uh, mid-1970s, I uh, met uh, quite a lot of Palestinian uh, students. And from them, for the first time, I think I heard that there's another perspective of the history of Palestine altogether. And that really pushed me towards um, doing some more focused research uh, as part of my academic uh, career. And I decided to go and do it outside of Israel in order to have uh, a perspective from outside the country. Uh, and I went to England, I went to the University of Oxford, where I did a, a, a PhD, a doctoral thesis, uh, with an Arab uh, supervisor. One of them was Albert Khourani, the late Albert Khourani, and, and another excellent supervisor, uh, Roger Owen, who today is the uh, director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies in Harvard University. And um, through them, I also started to have a more neutral, I would say, approach to, to, to the conflict. And uh, in Oxford I met even more Palestinian uh, students and colleagues, uh, in a way Palestinians who were more liberated to speak about their own perspective compared to those I met at the Hebrew University. And I met so several Palestinian scholars, among them uh, Edward Said and, uh, and others. Uh, and uh, I began to form an idea that Something of what I knew was wrong, and uh, something of what I knew wasn't there even, uh, and that I needed to go myself and look at the uh, history of the place in order to uh, establish my own position on the, on the issue. And uh, w after consulting with my supervisors, we've decided that I would work on the 1948 uh, history. And I chose the. I started by looking at the British. Uh, policy in 1948 because I thought they disliked both sides to such an extent that that would probably mean that they had a more neutral position than the others on, on, on the whole situation. Uh, in fact, when I started working, looking at the archives, and I should say that uh, both in Israel and in Britain there are uh, regulations about declassifying material. And every 30 years the, uh, the archives are declassified, are opened, which means that the archives of 1948 were open to the public, both in Israel and in Britain, and later on even in the United States, in around 1978. So when I started working, I was one of the first ones to look at documents which had been inaccessible, inaccessible until that time to most of the uh, scholarly uh, community. And um, I thought I would be interested in the British policy, but the more I looked at the archives, the more I was drawn into the story of 48 itself rather than to the story of the British policy. I did finish a, a, a dissertation on the British policy, which became my first book, but I really was not that interested anymore in the British policy. I suddenly realized that there was a story there of 1948, which is the formative story of both Palestinians and Israelis, which is the basis for the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, and that as an, as an educated Israeli, who had already one degree from university, I knew very little about what happened in the most important year in our country's uh, history. And um, ever since then, which is, let's say, the beginning of the 1980s, I became, I have to admit, I became obsessed with 1948 because it's, it's like, I suppose it's like an American who would go back to either 1776 or 1865 and would feel that he knew very little about that year, and that what he knew was all distorted. So it's, it's quite a, a shock, it's, it's a trauma in many ways, for whether you are a scholar or not a scholar, it doesn't matter. So what did I find that was so uh, uh, contradictory to what I was educated upon? I think that there were three major points about 1948, which for me were very crucial, uh, and what I found totally contradicted what I learned and what I was uh, told 
uh, uh, through the Israeli official educational system, through my service in the army, and through my general interest in, in history and, and politics. The first was that in 1948 uh, we were brought up to believe in Israel, that this was a war between a Davis and a Goliath. Uh, and because the Davis succeeded against all odds to, to win the 1948 war, it uh, produced the myth of the invincible Israeli army, which meant the Israelis felt that they were super, supermen. And uh, you can see how the same myth about the invincibility, the, the total superiority of the Israeli army uh, affected the Israeli myth and ethos after 48. And you can see it even in the Hollywood films uh, produced by Americans about how the Israelis are portrayed and of course how the Arabs are portrayed because of that. So you're not only thinking that the Arabs are maybe primitive, uh, mysterious uh, people, they're also cowards and people who are usually have no chance of winning any, any kind of a battle. Now, I also remember uh, uh, seeing in one of the uh, many atlases, many of the maps on the history of the conflict, that there was always this famous map of 1948. You had thick arrows coming from the Arab world and very, very thin, hardly discernible uh, arrows coming from the Jewish side. To, to enforce this idea of, of David and Goldeth. Now, looking at the document, it was very clear that there was, at the beginning of the war, a parity in the number of soldiers on both sides. And very early on in the war, the Jews had the upper hand in terms of soldiers, ammunition, logistics, and so on. Uh, so, that was one myth uh, that uh, we had to, to, to deal with. And for us, as, as, as Israelis it was important because it was not just a question whether we were superhumans or not because there was a very normal explanation why we won the 48th war which has nothing to do with David uh, beating Goliath but there was also, it was connected to the myth that Israel was under, uh, uh, on the eve of a second holocaust on the eve of, of, of extermination it was not and we or, or, I say we because I learned later on that I was not the only one who worked on, on the issue. Uh, Benny Morris and other historians, later to be known as the new historians, uh, worked more, more or less at the same time, and we all came to the same conclusions. And um, we found, or I found, that uh, the leaders of the Jews in Palestine knew exactly the balance of power. So they produce an atmosphere of fear, saying that the Jews are uh, under the threat of extermination in order to raise the, the, uh, the mobilization, the commitment of the Jewish community in Palestine. But they knew in actual terms that such a danger did not exist. And again, if you think about the American public, it was very important to sell to the American public that Israel is constantly under the danger of being annihilated, annihilated or exterminated, uh, which uh, blurs or obfuscates any, any American wish to look at the situation in a more balanced uh, position. So that was the, the first point. This, uh, uh, to this, I, I, should, I should add, and this still belongs to the first point, that we found out, and, and I was the first one to find out about it, I think, that the Israeli uh, uh, government, or the Israeli leadership, had, uh, prior to the war, an agreement with the strongest Arab army, the Jordanian army, to divide Palestine between the Jordanians and the Jews at the expense of the Palestinians, and because they had such a good a agreement with the strongest Arab army, it meant that it even reduced more the danger from the Arab world to the uh, uh, young Jewish state. Uh, and and that, that agreement to divide what used to be mandatory Palestine between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean, between the Hashemites, people who came from the uh, Arabian Peninsula with the help of the British and created their own kingdom next to Palestine, and the Jews who came from abroad, at the expense of the indigenous population, also had very far-reaching implications to my old concept of the conflict. So that was number, point number one. The second point, even is more important to my mind, is the, um, the whole issue of the refugee problem. How did so many Palestinians become refugees? The official Israeli narrative, the official Israeli historiography, told us at schools, and later on in the university, and, and from whoever you wanted to hear, that the population of Palestine was called upon by its own leaders and by leaders from other Arab countries to leave and make way for the invading Arab armies 
and with a promise to come back after the victory would be secured. This is, uh, for me, the most fascinating and tragic part of the story. I, find out that, I found out that um, because of the way that the United Nations Petition Plan evolved, and I don't want to go into too many details, but let me just put it in three very short and clear stages, so I think it would be clear to, to the viewers. The United Nations decide, offered to divide Palestine into two parts, almost I would say equal part, 50% to the Jews, 50% to uh, the Palestinians, at the end of the British mandate, in the, uh, through the year 1947. The Palestinians looked at that partition as unacceptable because they viewed the Zionist presence in Palestine as much as the Algerians viewed the French presence in, in, in Algeria. And as the Algerians would not have agreed to divide Algeria into two with the French settlers, so did the Palestinians not agree to divide Palestine with the Zionist status. And because of that, the Jewish leadership said to itself, if the Palestinians do not accept the partition plan, we also do not have to abide by the partition plan. And they decided in around March 1948, they meaning the Jewish leadership, that Israel, the new Jewish state, will consist not only on the 50 of the 50% promised by the United Nations, but an additional, almost an additional 30% of the land. That is to say, 80% of Palestine, according to the Jewish perception, was to be the state of Israel, even before the war of 1948. In fact, if you look at the map today, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip are the 20% which Israel had decided at that time not to include in the Jewish state. Now, why was that? Because it was... Because they had an agreement. That's a, good, that's a good question. Because I mentioned before the agreement they had with the Jordanian uh, 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 leadership, or the king, King Abdallah. And uh, in return for the Jordanian agreement not to attack the Jewish state, they were promised part of Palestine, which was the West Bank of today. The Gaza Strip is something that the Jewish leadership had not yet decided whether it wants such a large uh, a part of Palestine, uh, was, was such a, a part of Palestine which has had such a, a large number of Palestinians in it. Nobody knew beforehand that the Egyptians would occupy it. But more or less the perception was that Gaza doesn't have to be part of, of Israel, it could be part of Egypt. And the West Bank, what became the West Bank, was annexed to the Jordanians as part of the agreement with the Jews prior to the 1948 war. Now, in that, in the remaining 80% of Palestine, uh, there were 660,000 Jews and 900,000 Palestinians. Now, even the most moderate Zionists would not regard such a demographic balance as the uh, implementation of the Zionist ideal. The idea of having a Jewish state in Palestine meant, meant having a state with a Jewish majority, if not Jewish exclusivity. And definitely, if you look at the, at the situation, it was clear that if the Jews would not move anyone out of Palestine, uh, or out of the prospective Israel, they would be a minority within the state of Israel. And in the 10th of March, on the 10th of March, 1948, the Jewish military and political command have decided to cleanse Palestine, to expel as many Palestinians as possible out of the 900,000. We don't know even today how many exactly were expelled. We know that it moves between 750,000 to 800,000, which means the vast majority of the Palestinians who were supposed to be part of the Jewish state were expelled by force by Israel. Now, Betty Morris, who is a very thorough uh, researcher, went to Special Archives, which is in London, in Reading actually, not far away from London, where the British have monitored every trans transaction or and every uh, broadcast that uh, was in the air in those days, ever since 1936. And he found no proof to any such message coming uh, in the radio, there was no television, uh, coming in the air, or, and I found no evidence for anything in writing. And in fact, we know now for sure there was no such call. There was uh, an Israeli propaganda. Uh, myth to say that the Arab leaders called upon the population to leave. And they wanted to develop this myth because they wanted to hide the fact that they have decided in March 1948 
to expel the indigenous population of Palestine. Now we're talking here about 900,000 people who lived for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, mostly in villages, in 11 uh, towns. And when the war ends, uh, 500 villages are destroyed, 11 towns are gone, 750,000, maybe 800,000 out of 900,000 become refugees. Uh, their land, they, they own most of the land in Palestine. Their land is being confiscated by the Jewish state. They have no property rights anymore, no land rights. Uh, their houses were looted uh, and their careers were stopped. And it was a real human tragedy on a large scale, on a large scale. And the main responsibility, according to my historical research, lies with those people who decided to expel them, the Zionist uh, leadership. So that's point number two. Now, who are these yeah. people? Give them names. Yeah, I'll give them names. First and foremost, we have David Ben-Gurion, who was the uh, uh, chairman of the executive committee of the Jewish Agency and later the first prime minister of Israel, a very uh, uh, powerful man. Most of the crucial decisions have to go through him. If he had been against it, this decision would not have been carried out. But he had people who supported him, Eagle Alon and Moshe Dayan. Very young generals, we're talking about the early 20s, generals in their early 20s, but very eager to ethnically cleanse Palestine. Uh, Israel Galili, uh, Eliezer Kaplan, who was a kind of a finance uh, minister. And Mr. Transfer himself, as they called, they called him Mr. Transfer, was someone called Yosef Weitz who was responsible for the development and settlement uh, section in, in the Jewish agency. His, his duty before the war was to look at the Arab territories and say which is the fertile land uh, and which part of the Jewish agency will take the land and so on. He had trans transfer committees, official committees, which dealt in each region and region with how to execute the transfer and what to do after the transfer. If they can cause people to flee, that's the best. If they have to put people on trucks and transfer them, that's all, all right. If they have to massacre people in order to intimidate them into flight, into a flight, that's okay as well. I realized that uh, contrary to the Israeli official historiography, that there was only one massacre uh, in Deir Yassin, I realized that there were dozens of massacres. I once remarked that even a peace-loving movement like the Quakers had they been in such a similar situation, would have admitted to more than one massacre. It's, it's so ridiculous that the Israelis thought that they can sort of be let off with their own official history by saying, yes, of course, you know, one massacre did take place, which is ridiculous. Uh, I should say something about this ethnic cleansing operation. You know, I, start, I wrote about it for the first time in 1988-1989, and I'm rewriting now a new book about the ethnic cleansing of Palestine because I realized how little do we still know about it, the planning, the execution, so on. Because I, when I started my work as an historian, I thought the whole historical truth lies within the documents, the archives, the, the written sort of documentation. But then I realized the people who leave behind them, uh, documented evidence, are the expellers only, those who, defeat, who, those who were the victorious party. They have archives, they have documents. Those you have expelled don't have documents, don't have an archive. What they have is a collective memory. And you have to talk to these people before they die. And I started talking, and I'm now involved in a huge oral history project, uh, very much like the Israeli government, and I'm glad they did it, were involved in a huge oral history project about what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. And uh, through that project, I realized how little we know about what actually happened in each village and village, and how exactly the command from above to cleanse Palestine became a reality on the ground. It wanted an Israel free from as many Palestinians as possible, and having as much territory of Palestine as possible.
The third point, which is no less important, I think, than the other two, which contradicts the official historiography, the official narrative, is the whole story about the peace efforts after the 48th war. The uh, Israeli official historiography is that Israel's, the Israeli leaders, stretched their hand and uh, waited for the Arab side, for the Arab side to, you know, to take the opportunity and conclude a peace treaty with Israel uh, after the war of 1948. My own research found that actually it was the Arab side and the Palestinian side after 1948 that was willing to reach a compromise with Israel according to United Nations guidelines which were very simple, divide the land into two states, allow the Palestinian refugees to return to their homes, and you have to remember that most of the homes were, were still there in 1948, uh, and uh, internationalize the city of Jerusalem. And in fact, the American uh, administration at the time, uh, President Truman's administration at the time, supported the Arab and Palestinian position, and even for a very short while exerted heavy pressure on Israel to accept what the Americans deemed at the time as a very sensible solution. Uh, and the Israelis refused to, uh, to conclude a peace treaty under those terms. And then there was an, uh, an election year in America, uh, a different uh, American administration, different American policy, and the opportunity for peace was missed, uh, mainly because of the Israeli uh, intransigence and uh, extreme uh, policies. So, um, uh, if, if I sort of lump together the three points of 1948, just to make it, to clarify it once more, I would say that the first myth, or the first point, has to do with the myth of the Israeli, Israel being on the eve of another Holocaust in 1948, because that would justify everything else Israel would do afterwards, in the war itself and after the war. Israel was not, and in fact there was a chance for finding a different kind of a solution to the conflict in Palestine. But it was very useful for the Israeli government and later on for the Israeli uh, cultural systems to produce this myth of, 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 of Israel being on the eve of destruction. The second is that the 48 uh, war did produce the uh, Palestinian refugee problem not because the Palestinian refugees fled voluntarily from Palestine, but because they were ethnically cleansed from Palestine. And the third point was that there was a chance for peace after 1948, and not, not because the Palestinian and the Arab side were the uh, uh, inflexible and refused to enter such peace, peace negotiations, but on the contrary, because the Israelis were very happy with the results of the war, and they wished they didn't see any need to go into negotiations which might change their uh, or, or harm the achievements they had gained uh, uh, during uh, the war. So, so that was my, the major revelations about 48. And I have to say and repeat it, it was not only my, only my work. It, it's the work of that group called the New Historians. We're not that many, but three or four Israeli historians who were working at the time, at the same time, on the same archives, reaching the same uh, uh, conclusions or portraying the same picture uh, about the past. Israeli public or anybody uh, uh, deal with what you're suggesting? Yeah. It was a long press process of reaction which has its ups and downs and I will try and describe it because we came to the public arena if you want or, or into the public consciousness uh, in the late 1980s. So uh, let me just describe it sort of chronologically because it hasn't ended yet and I don't think there is a bottom line saying this is how the public received us. Uh, the first uh, reaction it was very suspicious, and uh, it came through the articles in the printed press, in the electronic press, uh, and there was an attempt to just push us aside by saying these are not professional historians, 
they work according to their ideologies, and they are uh, at best ignorant and at worst uh, agents of the PLO. But this passed because the, um, the uh, uh, global reaction was very different and very uh, respectful uh, and respected um, uh, academic centers. Uh, we, our books were accepted, our works were regarded as solid professional works of history. So the academic and political establishment in Israel had to review its, its, its position. And roughly, I would say, around the beginning of the Oslo process, September 1993, the attitude changed for, for, for better. Uh, in the sense that more people than before in the media, in the academia, in the educational system, not so much in the political system though, started uh, accepting at least part of what we were saying. Maybe not the whole picture, not, maybe not every interpretation we gave to the facts about 1948, but the skeleton of the story. And, 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 the, and, the, uh, uh, and the knowledge that uh, we were uh, deceived as Israelis for many, many years. This was very, very uh, uh, clear. And um, uh, uh, a heated debate started uh, in the electronic media, in the printed media. It was, it was quite public, and it's a small country. Now, the um, debate reached its peak as, or, or was still at the, at the highest level of public attention as long as the peace process continued, because it was very relevant to the peace process. In fact, at one point, there was a huge public debate between what can be called the old historians, that is, the historians who produced the old narrative, and the new historians in Tel Aviv University, which brought more than 700 people uh, uh, into the debate, which in Israel, which is a small country, is a huge number of people that would bother in the evening to, instead of watching television, whatever, go and hear an historical debate. Um, and uh, that was a very lively debate, and I think it, it, it really, uh, many people, even who didn't agree with us, agreed that we did something very, very positive to the uh, Israeli academia and to the Israeli research. Now, um, at the end of that debate, I would say, in the end of the 1990s, before the peace process collapsed, I can point to three sort of examples which show how far we went in our influence, let's say, or in the reaction to our uh, findings. One is a very famous television program in 1998. Israel celebrated its 50th anniversary, and for that celebration, uh, uh, the Israeli uh, first channel on TV prepared a, a documentary uh, um, a series on Israel's history, 22 chapters on the country's history, and uh, this was the flagship. And in that program, the first chapters dealt with 48, and you could see the influence of our work on the official narrative the Israeli documentary adopted here, that Israeli TV documentary adopted it. Not in totality, they didn't accept everything, but they admitted that there were expulsions. They admitted that Israel carries the responsibility for not having peace after 1948. They did deal with the myth that Israel was not alone, uh, as, as it is portrayed in our bo uh, school books uh, before 48. And uh, it was quite impressive. So that was one, 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 one example. The second example were textbooks prepared in those years for the Israeli educational system, which where I call it, were peppered with our ideas, meaning that substantially they haven't been, ch they have not changed, or fundamentally they have not changed. But here and there you could see reference in official textbooks for the Israeli uh, schoolchildren that were a bit different from the official version. The third one is an interesting story. It has to do with the, the way that the politicians were using our work and uh, the Israeli delegation uh, in the Oslo process, in the very beginning of the Oslo process, uh, encountered a lot of uh, problems of trust uh, from the Palestinian side. The Palestinian delegation did not believe the Israelis that they have changed fundamentally their positions on the refugees. So the Israeli delegation produced our works to show them that you see there is a new 
intellectual trend in Israel, and definitely we are thinking differently. Interestingly, in the Camp David Accord in the summer of 2000, it were the Palestinians who produced our work to show the Israelis that they are retracting on, retracting on, on their previous uh, promises to go f much further than they actually did in, in the summer of 2000. So, um, let's say the year 1999, before the total collapse of the peace process, I could move around this university feeling that I have some influence on the educational system, maybe even on the political system, de definitely on the scholarly uh, community, and uh, even the university treated me as uh, persona grata, someone, uh, I always say that in those years, when there were delegations coming from abroad, either to contribute money or, you know, to take interest in the university, I was always a welcome speaker uh, in those events as far as the university public relations uh, division is concerned. And I mention it because I want to show how the wheel has turned 180 uh, uh, degrees. Now came October 2000, the outbreak of the second uprising, the, uh, the, the Intifada, a total change in the general Israeli public mood about peace, about the Palestinians. And the books that were prepared under the influence or inspiration of the new historians were taken out of the educational system. Any television program that dares even to hint to a critical point of view is taken off the screen and my own position becomes very precarious in the university. It became even worse because my main colleague in the group of new historians did a kind of a mea culpa, Benny Morris, and he said that uh, 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 he was wrong to accuse Israel of war crimes or doing something wrong in 48. In fact, Israel had the right to transfer the Palestinians and has the right to do it again should it feel threatened. So I was, uh, um, and I think the, the, the net result of that reversal of public opinion was that the, my own university tried to expel me uh, and did not succeed. And now when all these foreign delegations come from abroad to the university to contribute money or to, to take interest in the university, uh, the university wants to make sure that I'm not in the campus. <laughs> Five years ago, they were looking desperately to find me, that I could talk to these people and show the pluralism of the university. Now they want to hide me because I embarrassed them with my uh, positions and uh, uh, ideas. So it shows you that there is a kind of uh, there are ups and downs. I, I think there was, the beginning was very suspicious, very hostile. Then there was an, a period of opening. And in a way, it's like the Israeli uh, public was opening the new book that I was offering, I and others were offering them, looked at the book and were terrified with what it meant for them. Because so many of them felt, wrongly by the way I think, but they felt that if I'm right, they have serious doubts about their moral right to be here. And I think that's what really terrifies them. They don't want to deal with it. They rather want to go back to their own idea of morality, which is if you are powerful and strong, then you're also morally right. Uh, if, if I succeeded in expelling someone, it means he was wrong. I don't want to go into the question whether what does, what does it mean, this expulsion? What does it mean that the victims of the Germans were victimizing others? Uh, what does it mean that the survivors of the Holocaust were creating such a terrible catastrophe for the Palestinian people? They don't want to deal with these questions. I feel that they will, well, we'll probably talk about it a bit later, but I, th I feel they have to deal with it. How do your students react over this whole period? Give me a little bit of the, their reaction Good. then and how that changed. Good. Um, it's, it hasn't changed that much, but there's a difference between two groups of students. The undergraduate students who are not sure yet what they will do in life, definitely are not sure whether they want to embark on an academic career or not, are very supportive, are very receptive. Most of them, of course, didn't live through the 48 period, they know that something is wrong and that the solutions that are being offered to them do not work. So, and they find it a refreshing approach. So I'm very popular with the young students. I call them young, I mean in the sense that they are undergraduate. The postgraduate students, those who go for a second degree or third degree, who already made up their mind that they want to become professional academics, are very worried that any association with me would affect their careers. It means that, uh, like good academics, they, the moment they really become professionally, 
they lose their moral courage and integrity. One of my students, although he was not directly a student of mine, uh, wrote a, a dissertation not under my supervision. In fact, I, I suggested to him not to be supervised by me because I knew it could spell uh, uh, trouble. And um, very naively worked with a very sort of mainstream historian in this university. And he looked thoroughly at what happened to several villages during the 48 war. And he used what Israeli historians do not like to use. He used oral history as well. He started interviewing Palestinians who still survived from that period. And um, in one of the villages, a huge village, uh, which is gone now, not far away from where we sit in Haifa, the village of Tantura, he heard from all the survivors and from some of the Jewish soldiers who participated in the occupation of the village that a terrible massacre took place there. In fact, one of the biggest massacre in 48. And he wrote a dissertation, very carefully, saying these are witnesses. Both them and the Jews insist that the massacre took place. So he said, I cannot say exactly how many were killed. I'm not preparing a legal suit against those who massacred. I'm just saying that in collective memory of Palestinians and Israelis alike, there is one massacre here we should wait and maybe one day even get fuller evidence about it. And the examiners liked the Caesars, and rightly so, and gave him one of the highest grades ever given in Haifa University to a master dissertation. The soldiers uh, who represent the veteran association of that unit sued him in court. And even before the trial began, he started to regret his own involvement because it, uh, it was uh, accompanied by many f telephone threats to him and his wife. And he's not so strong. I mean, I know as someone who is involved in such struggles, you, you, need, you need to be quite um, a good constitution for such struggles, let's say. And he doesn't have it. He doesn't have it. And uh, he uh, thought of a way out of it, which he regretted later, which was to sign an apology, which the lawyers of the other side succeeded in getting out of him. And he did not even consult his own lawyers about it. Twelve hours after he did it, he realized that this was stupid and he should go to court and defend his findings because he believed in his findings. But the court already said, this is it. You cannot retract on a retraction. I, I'm not a legal expert, so I don't know if it's true or it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It meant that there was no trial. But ever since that episode, he continued very forcefully saying that a massacre took place. And that's where I got in. I decided to do my own research. I also find documents. I went to the archives. And I wrote articles in English, in Arabic, in Hebrew, every language, claiming, A, that there was a massacre. I'm convinced. And second, I asked the soldiers to sue me. Because I said, I'm willing to go to court. I'm, I can prove to you that there was a massacre. Now, of course, the soldiers did not sue me. And heaven, until this very day, but the thing is that the university uh, decided to disqualify this poor student, although he, he stood behind it. And they first told him he has to revise the, the thesis, because the, uh, uh, an inquiry commission discovered that here and there he misquoted some of the interviews, which every historian does, especially an MA student. But anyway, they found it, and he could correct it. So he corrected it. But after he corrected it, they disqualified him again. And uh, this was really a, a, um, a campaign of harassment towards the student. And because I openly criticized the university on this issue, the university started to persecuting me and prosecuting me as well. Uh, and uh, it came to a disciplinary court. But luckily, there was such an overwhelming international pressure on the university that the procedures against me were suspended. There's another chapter in this saga, so to speak. And I'm not saying, I'm not telling this story because of my own predicament. Compared to my colleagues in the occupied territories, uh, my colleagues in the universities in the occupied territories, there's no comparison. It pairs in comparison to what they're going through. But it's part of the same picture of the demise of Israeli democracy, the demise of, of respect for basic human rights and civic rights. So before the saga, I should say that in between, after the events of, or after the, the failed attempt to expel me, I'm, I'm being boycotted in this university. I cannot participate in seminars. 
I, I mean this is conferences, uh, symposia, not officially. Nobody would admit to it officially, but let's say the Department of History wants to organize, and this has happened. They want to organize uh, a conference of the 1948 history, and they invite me, and they publish the fact that I would be one of the speakers. Immediately the authorities would call them to take my name out. And I think the most, uh, and I will email you one of uh, the um, responses to that boycott, by someone who doesn't like my views, and definitely not on my side, but he, he, he rightly said so, that the most terrifying thing of what happened to me is not what happened to me, but the fact that nobody of my colleagues have stood, stood against what, what they did to me. Uh, and knowing from Germany, they could be next. They could be next. And it was amazing. It was less the stupidity of the management here that they decided that they can, you know, chase me out. It is the fact that you have 600 university lecturers, and not one of them, came out and said, come on, come on, you can't do this. You may not like his views, but you can't not, not in a normal university. You, you, you don't do this, and then you claim that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. You can't do this. And anyway, they have, and it goes on. I wanted to break the, the boycott, so I organized the conference, and I decided to ignore the messages I got from above, that no, you cannot have a conference in university, you are barred from having conferences. I... Um, I went to the administration and I booked a room. Now, as you know, universities, there is the different wings. And nobody knows what the other... I'm a lecturer. I ask for a room. I get a room. Okay. So I published the fact that I have a room and I'll have a conference. And the conference was to, about the historiography of the 1948 war. I get there with the speakers and quite a large crowd, not too large. And there are ten security people with uh, um, uh, pistols and walkie-talkies. And uh, I went there with my wife. And uh, the chief security officer in the university pushes me to a nearby room in front of my wife and my other colleagues. I was shocked. I'd never seen such a thing in Harvard University. He hands me a letter, a personal letter, from the um, president of the university prohibiting me to have the conference because it's a, a severe breach of the, <laughs> of, of the university codex, which is ridiculous because the codex allows a lecturer to have a conference and that I would not, not be allowed and the room is blocked and the security guard would make sure that uh, I would not have the conference. And just before they pushed me into a room, the security officer informed the uh, president in the walkie-talkie, we caught him. As, as if they've caught Osama ibn Laden, you know, we caught him. He cannot have the conference. And then we reached the following agreement, that I would sit in the cafeteria with my guests, and provided I do not stand up, or not elevate myself, this would not be a conference. This would be a social gathering. Um, and, and this is more or less the situation nowadays. So it gives you an... And again, I'm not telling this because of my own personal predicament, because it's an indication of the level of freedom of speech and freedom of academic freedom in Israel uh, in, those, uh, in these uh, times. So, as, unless proven otherwise, I don't think we are seeing any uh, significant change in the basic Israeli mentality and perception of the reality. And that perception of the reality, if I will try to articulate it, I would say it's the following is that basically what matters in the world is the American position. And what matters in our uh, relationship with the Palestinians and the Arab world are two things. Our own power, our own capabilities, and the American position. Everything else is irrelevant. The United Nations position, the Western position, the world position in the civil society in the America, in America if they have a different position than the administration. And even in the administration, not everybody matters. Uh, Secretary of State doesn't matter. Um, and uh, because of that combination, that we are still very powerful militarily, and because the people who matter are behind us, the American administration, we in fact can do whatever we want in our relationship with the Palestinians. And what do we want in our relationship with the Palestinians? We want, by force, to impose a solution 
that caters to our interests and needs. And what we want is to annex parts of the West Bank so that we can include the major settlement blocks in it, so that we won't have to go into an internal civil war. They don't mind if you call the other half of the West Bank a Palestinian state. I think they would like to push the Palestinians from the part that they annex to the part that will become a Palestinian state. Anyway, they don't think the Palestinian state would survive. Definitely they would, don't want to talk about any reasonable solution to the refugee problem or the Jerusalem problem. And they think that with time, power and force would impose the solution in such a way that it would become part of the Middle Eastern reality. Now, uh, they also think that they have all the right to deal very forcefully with the Palestinians inside Israel if they would show even the slightest uh, ideas of autonomy, uh, uh, you know, or they would show a collective will to, to, to act so as to change the, the present uh, situation. As for the, what shall we call them, the silent majority, those people who, I'm not sure they're not showing interest. Uh, I think it's true that on one level many of them find life more harder than previous years because of the economic crisis. It's true that many, many, many of them find politics repugnant. Uh, in a way it's something they don't want to, to deal with. But the principal reason why the Israeli political system can go on with the same policies is because that silent majority also harbors certain images and perceptions of the Palestinians as well. I think Israeli Jewish society is a racist society. It dehumanizes the other Arab, and definitely the Palestinians. This is something that they uh, suckle from a very early stage in their life. It's part of the socialization, part of the educational system in Israel. From cradle to, 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 to grave, you, you get a certain message about who the Palestinians are how should they be treated? And that's, in a nutshell, it's a very dehumanized way of looking at the Palestinians. And if you dehumanize someone, you don't, you can look at a TV and watch people are being killed, babies being killed, uh, of the other side, and not at all get excited or ask yourself. I'll give you one example. The, um, there's a unit in the Israeli army which belongs to the spokesperson of the army. And their job is to go and film for the army's propaganda. <laughs> I have a soldier who says that, he's one of my students, and he told me that uh, when they really are doing a good job, they get a certain perk, they, they get some sort of uh, special prize. What is the prize? Is to get from the army, in slow motion, the film in which the Israeli uh, Air Force dropped a bomb of 1,000 kilos on the uh, residential area in Gaza, which killed a lot of children and uh, women in order to kill one terrorist. And this is the, the prize of the soldiers. And they will love watching it, because you can see exactly, because it was taken from the aircraft. So you can zoom on the destruction, on the killing. This is the kind of, of, of mentality and reality which allows people to uh, be bystanders, uh, not only to things that already had been done to the Palestinians, but I am very fearful that they, these people would be bystanders uh, even when worse things would be uh, inflicted upon the Palestinians. I made a few years ago a, a film which actually followed the lecture tour I gave in Britain. And its title was The State of Denial, Israel as a State of Denial. And it followed certain phases in the way the Israeli establishment uh, denies what had happened in 48, denies what happens in the occupied territories, and even denies what happened lately in the occupied territories. And the film was very pessimistic, and I felt that. It was very uh, uh, dark in a way. But I, I finished it in a more optimistic tone. I said to the viewers there that, you know, I showed you in the film how much is invested in Israel in denying, in making sure people do not know. Which means that they think that if people would know, they would react very differently. They were probably out of their Jewish history, out of their personal morality, would say, not in our name, we don't want to hear about it. It's very convenient not to know, but if you start to know, 
you start to be troubled and you react. So I think that I'm optimistic. In time, people would know. It's a matter, first of all, that people do not know. And when people would know, there is a chance for a different reaction. So my guess is that people are not indifferent. People are very happy with not knowing. It says very well the um, government. You know, they're trying now to put out of the television screen CNN and BBC World Service because they know how easy you can get here in Israel. Because they know how easy with zapping you can get it by, by mistake to CNN. And, and God knows, I mean, we know CNN, we know BBC World Service. It's, it's not the pro Palestinian uh, television broadcast. But just even that terrifies them, that people would see it a little bit more neutral. Uh, it's tragic, <coughs> it's discouraging, but on the other hand, it's very encouraging, encouraging. Because it means that they know that the reality is so obvious now. What can justify three, five tanks going through a village and just destroying it? For whatever reason. And killing of children and women. Nothing. And they know it. So they'd rather not deal with the explanation. They'd rather not show the pictures. We have to understand, Israeli viewers see very little of what goes on in the occupied territories compared to viewers outside. And now that the Israelis have started killing journalists, and intimidating the others, uh, probably the world at large will see less what is going on inside. Um, so coming back to your major question there about people being indifferent. I'm not sure they're being indifferent. I, I sort of give fine-tuning to that uh, definition. Um, they live in denial and oblivious and are oblivious to what's happening because someone makes sure that they will remain in that situation. I think that exposing the reality for what it is is something which eventually even start <coughs> a movement of opposition inside Israel. I think it's very, very important because the Israelis, and most of the Israelis are decent people. If they start judging the action, their own actions and the actions that have been done in their names according to universal human, human uh, values, they will not be able to look at the mirror. I have an article which is called Breaking the Mirror. And I wrote in that article saying that the Israelis are still have mirrors in the, installed in their homes where they don't see their own reflection. They see a poster. And I want to break that. How do you get the Israeli public uh, to get this? I think that there are two ways of, of doing it. Uh, and uh, the best but the less feasible, unfortunately, in, this, in these circumstances, is that people who are in the center of disseminating information, journalists, academics <coughs> in Israel, uh, who know, who know, would start telling the truth and will be less afraid about the personal consequences of doing it. And the more there will be of them, the less dangerous it would be for them anyway. Therefore, I think people in those areas should understand that there is a price tag attached to such a thing and I think this will work. There's, there has to be a very strong outset pressure and therefore I, I called upon the world academia to start judging and criticizing Israelis who are not Israeli academics who are not fulfilling that role uh, very severely. Not invite them, disinvite them, not come to their conferences, boycott them. Because people should understand this is the only way of uh, conveying the message. And this is a very powerful message that everyone individually can pay a price for taking such uh, even an uh, active role, a passive role, in allowing its own country and system to um, execute or continue to execute a reign of terror and intimidation in the occupied territories. Where does, where does Israel go and where does yeah. Zionism go? Absolutely. I think what would happen <coughs> is something that already started happening, but it would be accelerated, is that the Israeli Jewish society, leaders and people alike, would reach a juncture from which they can turn either right or left. They won't be able to move ahead 
which means to continue with the oblivion and the denial. And it's a big question where they would move to. And now let me describe the two options. One is to move towards a country or a state that would be based more on international values such as democracy, liberalism, uh, uh, freedom of rights, freedom of human rights, civic rights, and so on. In other words, a, a, a society which would lower the fences between itself and the neighbors, recognize that they are part of the Middle East, recognize what it means really to have a democracy, be more blind towards race, color, uh, nationality, and religion, which they are not today. That's one option. <clears throat> and the other option is to go to the right to build higher walls between Israel and the rest of the world because they know about the, the reality now, give up altogether the whole idea of democracy or liberalism, freedom of right, human rights, civic rights, create a kind of a theocracy like Iran uh, based on a very uh, strict interpretation of the Jewish uh, uh, halakhic law, law and um, uh, and sort of uh, hope uh, that God and maybe a similar uh, regime in America would, would uh, make sure that the Jewish state would survive forever and forever. Now, we are conducting surveys here in this university about these two options for years. And unfortunately, so far, the majority of the Jews, if they stand theoretically in such a juncture, prefer the theocracy, what I call the, the lotocracy, you know, the theocracy of the zealots. They prefer the theocracy to the democracy. Well, it seems consistent with the wall that's going Absolutely. through the West Bank. I mean, that, Absolutely. if there was ever an example of, of, your, of your turning right there, that's a perfect that's example. That's a perfect, a, a perfect example. However, I'm an historian, so which means I have a more long-term perspective on life. I think that it may even be a necessary turn to the right in order to go back to the left which means that in the long run I still have what is left of my confidence uh, that people would be awake, if they have not woken up now, they will be wakened, woken up uh, if indeed the present Israeli uh, conduct would even get worse. Hardly imaginable, but it can get worse. It can get worse. I hope it will wake up people, as one hope that in America people would wake up. Uh, sometimes you need uh, a certain number of casualties, a certain number of uh, breaches and violations of your basic rights before you awaken up. Sometimes you have, it, happen, it has to happen to you before you realize it's important, because you're not impressed when it happened to others. I, I will end with a short uh, uh, anecdote. I always like the anecdotes instead of these abstract, heavy academic uh, discourse. I moved to a new uh, neighborhood uh, with my family. Uh, and the local newspaper of the, of the little town I moved into wrote a very negative profile on me. Like the big en new boy in town, you know, the, the enemy has, has come to reside with us. And my wife had a great idea. She, she said, you know, in, instead of writing a letter to the paper, said it's all wrong, this profile is, is, is an assassination of your character, why don't we decide that once a week our house at 9 o'clock in the evening is open for people? And people are invited to come and talk to you. She bought me a high stool on which I sit. And I said, okay, we'll do it, but nobody will come. I said, let's see. Fifty people showed in the first meeting in my living room, which does not contain fifty people, but they, they, they arrived to talk to me. And we are since, it's a year and a half now, and we are conducting once a week talks about one issue alone. What happened in 1948? What do we know about 48? And how does this affect our life in Israel? And how would it affect our future? And it started in a very hostile way. And it ended up, in, it hasn't ended, but we have reached a position where people believe me, people absorb part of it, and I can see that there is hope in convincing people that m the fact that what had happened in 1948 is so crucial to understand what should happen here, not in the sense that the Israelis should become refugees themselves now, that what the Palestinians want is acknowledgement of what happened to them. 
And it, with that acknowledgement, all the other issues would be very uh, insignificant compared to everything else. So I'm hopeful because I talk to people at the eyes level. You know, I, I don't write these articles and wait for, for emails, responses. I talk to people. Uh, that's the good news, and I get very good responses. The bad news is that you can talk to as so many people in one year uh, as you can talk to, and that's a limited number. So if I have another 500 years, I'm very hopeful. But I do hope that something there is changing. But I admit it's very, very difficult to be optimistic in those years. But one has to, otherwise there's no point in staying here. If you had something to say to the American people, what would you want to say? What do you want to yeah. part here? I, I think that there is a, a large number of American pe citizens who do not know how closely they are associated to what's go what goes on here. And because they are so closely linked, and I will say in a moment how, I think they carry responsibility, both as Americans but also as human beings, what goes on. Because the mechanism of evil and destruction that Israel is using in order to implement its vision of a Jewish state comes at the expense of the indigenous population of Palestine. It costs a lot of money. You need a lot of weapons in order to implement that kind of reality by which the Palestinians would lose any right or any title to the land of Palestine, to their homeland. It would not have been possible to expel the Palestinians, to occupy what was left on Palestine, to build settlements, to resist peace with the Palestinians, had not the Americans supported Israel with money, weapons, and diplomacy. And uh, it is the American politicians who are being elected that give the diplomatic supports. It's the American taxpayer, taxpayer who gives Israel the uh, financial leverage to carry out its settlement policies in the West Bank and the occupied territories to carry on a very cruel, probably the cruelest occupation we have nowadays uh, uh, in Palestine. So uh, it's up to the American uh, people to rethink whether in their name and with their money such things should be done. But in the case of Palestine, uh, it's a very uh, evil chapter, I think, in, in the American involvement in global affairs, and, and Americans should think about it. Should think about it. On a human level, on a more human level, I, you know, I've toured America, and I've come to places in mid Midwest and Mid America. I talked to farmers, and I felt that the moment you face farmers or people who have small businesses, uh, people who know how difficult it is to go through life uh, and made something out of life. The moment you explain to them that this basic elementary right is denied to Palestinians and had been denied, had been denied to Palestinians ever since 1948, and most of them were farmers, uh, I think you find how people uh, sympathize, how people immediately sympathize with a Palestinian farmer that had been expelled in 1948, with a Palestinian shopkeeper who had been expelled in 1948, with a Palestinian student who has been denied uh, from his university. And it's very clear that American citizens would understand who is the victim and who is the victimizer. And traditionally, they should go with the victim and not with the victimizer.